So we're here at Cape Receive, um, close to the university, and we are going to be looking for echinoderms uh, for the Zoo V111 practical. And with me, I have um, two of our technicians and technicians and one of our lab assistants to, to help. So we're going to show you where we're finding the creatures that you are using for your prac. As you can see, this is the high end of the rocky shore and there's not too many things living up here because it's way harder to live up here because the tide is out for many hours and if today was a sunny day they'd be baking in the heat and drying out so it's much easier to live down at the bottom there so and that's where most of the echinoderms are going to be found so we'll go and start scrounging in the pools close to the bottom end of the intertidal zone as I'm walking down, I can see here is a limpet scar. So there's the limpet siphon area, and this is its home base, so to, so to say. And um, the one that lives here has moved off, and it's probably this one grazing on the algae. We can see we're starting to get to the lower end of the intertidal when you get soft bodied animals like these anemones that are permanently here so they clearly um, show us that this pool doesn't dry out with with without going tired these rocks are covered in algae so they are super slippery so one always has to wear appropriate clothing um, like booties to make sure that um, you have good grip and you always walk slowly and you're careful when you're working so the tech staff have started um, looking for creatures and I'm going to be helping them find them. So we're here in the lower intertidal area and we're certainly finding more life. So here's a really nice large anemone but you've studied these already. So we're looking for echinoderms. So we'll start with, with the echinoderm hunt and I'm currently searching for brittle stars so as soon as I find one. Um, I will show you those. So sea cucumbers are probably the easiest to find along with urchins. So normally if you turn a rock over you'll see they are attached. There's two different species. In actual fact there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sea cucumbers under this particular rock. And if we look at the bottom we have a superclipphus. Um, he's over here. And here we have um, a sea urchin. So the sea urchin is attached to a whole bunch of rocks. Um, so we'll take him to show you in the lab. And what else do we have under this rock here? We have a olicroc. Um, so you would have studied these as well. You can see there's its little um, trapdoor. So that's one of the common intertidal gastropods and we'll put him back where we found him and we'll take the sea urchin to show you. So that's the oral surface and that's the aboral surface and typically they are living um, usually under rocks um, in shelter from the sun in the daytime um, grazing on the rock surface. One can handle them quite easily if you just handle them gently. You don't want to squeeze it because the spines can break off in your hand. So um, they're relatively harmless if you handle them gently. The subtropical and tropical species, the long spine sea urchins, which are black, uh, they are the ones that actually have um, uh, poisonous spines and these can be problematic, especially if you get stuck by one of those. So one of these sea cucumbers I'm going to take off gently um, and this will come back to us to have a closer look in the crack. But you can see uh, clearly it's tube feet over here where my thumb is and hopefully when he's undisturbed during the crack you'll be able to see the tentacles coming out. Um, so these guys are, are amazing intertidal creatures and very very common along our rocky shore area.
it's always good practice if you're looking for animals to turn your rocks back over again so that the animals that are hiding at the bottom are again sheltered from the sun. So this rock I've just lifted up and we are very lucky to see abalone so we have a really small one and ah, there's actually three here it's very nice to see we've got sea cucumbers we've got eggs um, we even have what looks like an ascidian over there and a large chitin so you would have learned about these in the mollusks uh, one two three four five six seven eight plates on their body so they're totally blind they don't have eyes so they're just creeping around the bottom of the rocks and um, they're grazing you can see where this carton is eaten off um, the algae in this particular area where it's living but it's really nice to see the little abalone around I'm not going to force it off the rock I'm actually looking for brittle stars I haven't seen any yet um, he has a nice urchin so you can see how these urchins are living in the wild. The tide's coming in now, so um, we have to work quite quickly. And it's covered with um, debris, pieces of seaweed, shells. So that's how they're maintaining some camouflage. So underneath the rocks are the place to find all these creatures. Um, there's a lot of stuff here. Um, a lot of the animals that you've already been studying but uh, no brittle stars yet so I'm going to turn that rock back over again and make sure that they are protected from the sun so here we finally have an area where we've got brittle stars so they like a substrate that's a little bit sandy and so there's two over here you can see they're quite fast moving they're actually the fastest moving of all the echinoderms uh, completely harmless um, so we'll bring these two back you can see how they're crawling all over my hand we'll bring them back to the lab for you to have a closer look at okay so yeah we have an asteroid starfish so in the class asteroidae um, and you can see on the underside, in the center of each arm, are the ambulacral grooves and all the little tube feet. So this starfish is going to come back to the lab with us and you can see it was living actually under the rock. Um, many starfish are actually predators. Um, some of them are scavengers. It's quite a pretty little one. So um, this will come back to the lab for us, for you guys. To... So under this rock, we can see a gazillion little isopods uh, running down they are important scavengers in the intertidal zone so you can see the isopods over there in the center of the screen um, there's lots there's amphipods as well um, and they're important in rocky shore ecology literally under every rock is life so there we have a beautiful um, abalone and quite a couple of echinoderms well, we've got the Aholothroidia um, over there, uh, a couple of different species, and we've got the sea urchin, a little sea urchin, and we have an oyster here. And what's underneath the water? More echinoderms, mostly urchins and sea cucumbers, they are clearly very common in, in the intertidal area. Every one of them has a little something on, even a terrestrial leaf on that one. Um, and you can see that abalone is very uncomfortable with being exposed to the light. So it's moving quite quickly across the rock, um, trying to find shelter again um, and be out of the visible eye of potential predators. It's quite amazing how it uses its foot to move. And there it goes, it's trying to trying to find a spot to hide. But yeah you can see a really nice large anemone and if I put my hand there you can see just how big it is. Um, it's probably as big as my outstretched hand. 
very important um, in rocky shore ecology, these anemones. Large isopod. Here we have a nice little example of an intertidal crab. And if we flip it over, we can see that it's a male. So this one I truly can call he. Here we have a sand prawn in the intertidal, also living in the, the sandier rock pools on the lower end of the intertidal zone. Here we have a sea sponge growing on the rock, so you would have studied these already. Oh, Chad has lifted up a large rock and we can see what's underneath it. So two dominant echinoderms, the sea cucumbers and the urchins. And what else do you have, Chad? There's two abalones. Very nice to see abalone around with the poaching pressure that is on. Mm. And we have quite a few large chitons. They're totally blind. They live attached to these rocks and their grazers. You can see where this one here has actually been grazing the algae. Mm. This was a nice big rock to lift up. That's a sponge. Over there, some more sea sponge. And at the top, by Chad's hands, is more sea sponge there. Yep. And there'll be lots of amphipods and isopods um, in these in these little gaps and holes in this porous rock. So they're also important. Oh, a lot of cartons under that rock. And we have some green anemones on the end here. Those are not good to touch. Um, so Brian, you mind your hands there because they tend to give you sensitive fingers for a few days. And we've uh, oh how wonderful we have a flatworm. Um, so these are, are really really interesting. There's a couple of flatworms here. Let me gently take it off and just show you in the water column. That's a nice fine briny. Um, so there we have a good example of a flatworm. A small gastropod. We're soon going to run out of places to explore as the tide's coming in. So we have two high tides and two low tides every day. And it's starting to push now. Where? In this tide pool here we have some colonial ascidians, but these have broken off from deep water reefs. Um, this particular one is the um, common name of dead man's tongue because they look all purple and deathly um, on the deep reefs that they occur on because um, red light is lost very quickly um, based on the visible light spectrum and its ability to penetrate water so they appear like a purpley color um, these are probably all very dead by now so there's a, a stalk that they're attached to and then it's uh, inhalant and exhalant holes all over the place and each set of holes corresponds to one um, individual that lives in this colony so they're all living together in this mass uh, there's a few more dead ones here washed in by the last um, big seas we had so you can see the two holes I'm trying to give you a close-up of this. If you look in the dead center, you can see there's two holes to each little individual, but I'm calling them an individual, but they're living colonially as part of this very decaying um, colonial ascidian. And here is a decaying large solitary ascidian. You can see how big it is relative to my hand. Sure. So here is the inhalant and exhalant siphons. This one has come off a, a deep reef. And uh, these ones usually don't occur intertidally. So someone has already 
extracted the animal for bait you can see there it's been cut so obviously when it was still fresh and washed up they they took the bait from it the animal from it um, which is good bait for for some of our coastal fish species so this is a solitary ascidian a really huge one so this one would have been growing 20 30 meters underneath the water and if i put my foot next to it you can see it's rather large what do you have there mfundo Nothing fancy, just a lot, really big cartons. Oh, we've got a lot of, again, oh yes, that's a sponge. That's a different type, wow. And we've got lots of, there's more sponge, lots of sea cucumbers and urchins at the bottom and certainly a lot of cartons. important scavenger in the intertidal zone. These glass shrimps in the genus Palaemon. So Barney, you have a whelk there. And whelks are voracious predators actually in the intertidal. Now, can you give us a, a bottom view? Let's have a look. Yeah, there's its little trap door. And so these are important species predatory in the intertidal and they have a little proboscis that they use to insert into their prey and they literally use a salivary type enzyme to digest their prey and suck up the contents with their proboscis. So they're pretty nifty intertidal creatures. So here we have a whelk shell that's now occupied by hermit crab and we seem to have a lot of Hermit crabs all gathered together in whelk shells. I watched a documentary where they actually line up and they measure out one another. Yes. And the first one, the one at the front, makes a move to swap his shell, and everyone starts <laughs> That's fantastic. jumping into the shell, different sizes. <laughs> so this could be um, some type of arrangement. <laughs> An arrangement of hermit yeah. crabs. Where they measure one another up and see who can fit into a shell. So we have a broken piece of the structure that the Cape Reef worms make. So there's obviously no worms left in here, but this is the remains probably broken off when we last had rough seas of their colony that's basically on the very lower end of the intertidal. That's where they occur. Um, we're now sort of a little bit up from that. So yeah, none, none left in here by the looks of things, but there's bound to be colonies of Cape Reef Worm further out there on the lower end of the intertidal. So here we have a nose striped clipfish. They always nice to see. Pretty camouflage living underneath um, the rocks in the intertidal. Beautiful little fish. And if we have a close look here, we can see a brittle star in its natural habitat. Let's take the seaweed out the way. There's a couple of them here. The tide's coming in. You can see they like these sandy areas crawling in. See the sand in these tiny spaces. Oh nice, some old abalone shells and some wonderful brittle star specimens that Barney's holding. So the only echinoderms that we haven't found of the five classes are the crinoids class Crinoidea and that's because they are subtital species so we do have them here in Algoa Bay but um, unless it's an extremely low tide and we're snorkeling or on scuba we're less likely to find them. Quite a few clipfishes in the family Clanidae 
in this tide pool. They're masters at camouflage. So you can see how they sort of blend into the bottom in the middle of your view and really look like a stone. Never seen it. It's beautiful.